Is the Pascal Siakam trade to the Sacramento Kings really, truly dead? I don't know if I believe that. I still think there will be some conversations between the Kings and Toronto Raptors involving Siakam as we get closer and closer to the trade deadline. But maybe it's only a matter of time before trade talks truly, fully end because of what the Kings are and aren't willing to include in a trade. Sean Woodley from the Locked On Raptors podcast joins me to break down everything Kings and Siakam right here on Locked On Kings. You are Locked On Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Hello and welcome into Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all season long. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports anchor and reporter for ABC 10 News. And uh, yeah, we don't need to talk too much or anymore at all about what happened between the Kings and the New Orleans Pelicans uh, on uh, or last night on Sunday. So let's talk about what happened on Friday between the Kings and the Toronto Raptors. Yes, the Kings beat the Raptors, which is great. We talked about that. You can go and check out the full post-game conference where, uh, or rather post-game podcast where uh, we discussed that Kings win and spent a lot of time also discussing all of the Pascal Siakam trade rumors surrounding the Sacramento Kings uh, and, and the Raptors before that game took place. Now, I shared with you there that I feel that even though it was reported that the Kings were out or were, were removing themselves from the Pascal Siakam trade sweepstakes, it was reported that Friday, actually like an hour or so before the, the game between the Kings and Raptors took place. Even though that report might have been valid or might still be valid right now. I, I don't believe there's just so much smoke around Siakam. Plus, Siakam might be the best player available for the Kings to trade for if they're truly looking to add a, 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 a major piece to help make them a contender this year. I, I, I don't believe it's completely dead. I still think there will be conversations between the Kings and the Raptors involving a, a Pascal Siakam trade. But... Are those trade talks unnecessary, right? Will they all go the same way, which is essentially, hey, we want Siakam. What do you want for Siakam? We want Keegan Murray. Okay, well, that's not happening. Okay, well, then we're not making a deal. Or the Kings aren't willing to pay Pascal Siakam the max like it was it, it was reported. And that means Pascal Siakam's not going to want to resign to the Kings, so the Kings are not going to make a deal for Siakam for anything of, of significant value. Maybe the writing is on the wall that nothing is going to get done, but there's still so much time between now and the trade deadline. I still do think that at, at the very least conversations are going to reopen and, uh, uh, and, and be revisited. But instead of kind of talking my way through it myself, I thought let's get the Raptors perspective on this entire thing. Sean Woodley, amazing host of the Locked On Raptors podcast. He joined me before on Locked On Kings. He joined me last year when we talked a lot about a potential OG and an OB trade, in addition to the Kings potentially having his interest in Pascal Siakam. So these, the Kings and Raptors, they've been connected for a little while. So Sean joins me here on Locked On Kings. We'll talk our way through the, the Siakam sweepstakes, what he thinks the Raptors will want or demand for Siakam, if the Kings should be willing to give that up, if the Kings should be willing to pay Siakam the max. We talk about a lot of stuff here. I hope you enjoy it. Sean Woodley here from Locked On Raptors joining me on Locked On Kings. All of the chatter around the Sacramento Kings and Toronto Raptors game on Friday had everything to do with what was happening off the court. Pascal Siakam directly connected to the Sacramento Kings in trade talks. We know the Kings have had interest in a couple of Raptors players for a while. One of them no longer available because he's in New York. Sean Woodley from the Locked on Raptors podcast. He and I have, have sat down together before and talked about these two players and possible trades. And we mainly focused on OG because the possibility of Pascal Siakam just never really seemed like it was it was that probable or the Kings would be willing to give up what it would take to get Pascal. Lo and behold, here the Kings are in a position where they're 
reportedly aggressively pursuing Pascal. And then in the same day, they pull out of the Siakam sweepstakes. Well, I have spec uh, skepticism that the Kings are truly out, but that's where we stand right now. Sean Woodley back here on Locked On Kings from the Locked On Raptors podcast to help us kind of break down this situation and discuss what it would take in his mind to get Siakam. Maybe we'll figure out where the negotiations broke down or if this has everything to do with Siakam and 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 his unwillingness to, to sign an extension with the Kings or wanting more than the Kings are willing to offer. There's so many branches to this tree, Sean. But what was your reaction initially to that kind of 12 hours of randomness of the Kings building up momentum to land Siakam and then they're out of the sweepstakes, apparently. Yeah. First off, thanks for having me, Matt. Nice to chat with you. Um, yeah, I, I think for me, I didn't really... I wasn't all that moved by any of it on Friday. Like the Shams reporting about the Kings being quote unquote serious, you know, seriously in talks or whatever the whatever the word serious was thrown around. I kind of think that word a should mean something. And frankly, I don't think unless Keegan Murray is on the table that the talks can get serious. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I kind of think that's where it stops and it's not because, uh, you know, I think the, the Raptors are these hard-headed people who aren't going to trade their players and to hang on to them for dear life. No, I, I think they value their own guys. Mm. And I think the Raptors kind of have the hammer in this one where they can just extend Pascal Siakam and have an all-NBA player who's playing really good basketball, by the way, just be on their team for the next handful of years. Maybe look to trade him down the line if it lines up or just have him kind of grow with this newly assembled core they have with Emmanuel Quickly and Scotty Barnes kind of at the, at the forefront among the young guys. RJ Barrett's playing incredible basketball since coming over in the trade as well. And all of a sudden, Siakam really fits on this team and offers scoring punch that they really need around all of the other pieces they have. And so I think it's going to take a massive offer to get them to move off of Pascal. And I think they will be very happy as much as all of the reporting has been that they're ready to push him out and they don't want him on the team. Look, they flirted with parting ways with Kyle Lowry like a dozen times the last decade. And it always ended up circling back to, you know what? You're our guy. We love you. We're going to keep you around because you're valuable and good. And I kind of think looking to how the Kyle situation played out over many, many years in Toronto in the last decade is pretty informative of how this could play out with Pascal. I don't think they're under any obligation to move him because all the reporting is that Pascal wants to be in Toronto. And so barring someone like a Keegan Murray being on the table, I really don't see this getting over the finish line. And if Keegan's not in, in the conversations, again, that's where the term serious kind of falls on deaf ears for me. Touching on, on on what you said there about the Raptors being willing or, or being able just to just extend Siakam and, and not having to make a move. Do the Raptors really want to do that, though? Are they really okay with that based off of where their franchise is right now, the direction that they're headed? And these reports, now granted, these reports don't have to always 100% be accurate. Trade season is a lot of smoke and you're trying to find the actual fire, right? But the, the reports have been like, hey, the, the Raptors are, are trying to move quickly on a Siakam trade here. They're trying to get a deal done. And, and and clearly, like, I mean, I don't know about how long OG's future was in Toronto, but to me, their willingness to eventually trade OG, well, maybe they felt that they weren't going to be able to keep him and, 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 and re-sign him. But I willing- think it was made clear, like, behind the scenes from what you hear that OG basically said, yeah, I'm not going to come back unless you give me the full max, right? So I, I think that kind of pushed their hand a little bit. Understood. And maybe like, what if that's the same situation with Siakam? Do you think one, like kind of a two part question here. One, do the Raptors really want to bring Siakam back and, and, and based off their current timeline, does it make sense to you? And then number two is, are these, are the Raptors willing to pay him a max deal or close to a max deal based off of the timeline again? I think, you know, based on the way they've kind of carried themselves with Pascal, kind of dangling him for the last year or so, I think if you gave him the truth serum, they'd say, hey, we would probably prefer to move Pascal for like a young, bankable piece we can pair with Scotty Barnes. I don't think they're interested in moving him for picks. This was exactly what we saw with the OG trade where, you know, everyone got all up in arms. Oh, how could they not accept the draft picks from the Memphis Grizzlies? Oh, no. They want real players. They want players to pair with Scotty Barnes, who is having a star leap this season, is already in year three, is going to get expensive in a year and a half, and they want players who can run with Scotty Barnes. And I do think it's been proven that Pascal Siakam can, in fact, run with Scotty Barnes and be part of a pretty fruitful combination there. Obviously, that the age is a thing. I think... 
you know, again, if you sort of ranked their their options here, moving Pascal for a real bankable sort of future projectable piece you compare with Scotty Barnes, number one. Number two, though, is just keep Pascal Siakam and not trade him for a bunch of stuff that's not really going to help them build a real team around Scotty Barnes. And so I think given the market right now, given all of the implications that Pascal would rather stay in Toronto and won't re-sign with some team he gets traded to, I do think that points towards option one not really being on the table, right? Are you going to get from the Pacers enough to make it worth it? Are you going to get a Keegan Murray from the Kings to make it worth it? I have my doubts. And frankly, we'll get into it. I don't think the Kings should put Keegan Murray on the table for Pascal Siakam. And so given all that, with option one being off the table, I do think option two of, you know what? We've had success in the past of retaining our guys, giving them runway to work. And now there's actually a team that makes sense. The OG Pascal Scotty trio had run its course. It didn't work. And reassembling the roster around those three guys to make it work was going to be too tall in order without moving one of them. Well, they moved one of them. They got Emmanuel quickly, who has completely transformed this team's offense. So the number two offense in the NBA since the trade happened, that'll come down surely. But they, you saw it on Friday night. The Raptors can score now in a way that they just couldn't before and quickly fits beautifully next to Scotty Barnes and Pascal Siakam. I also think the Scotty Pascal dynamic, there used to be a lot of overlap between them. I think that's kind of gone now. Scotty kind of operates as a wing. He is like a 39% high volume three point shooter all of a sudden. And he plays small ball five, which kind of go perfectly playing off of what Siakam does as like a playmaking post hub, uh, po- post hub at the four, right? I-, I think the fit there's a lot cleaner than it was a year ago before Scotty made this jump and before quickly came to town. And I think we're seeing over the three and one start the Raptors have had here since the trade that, okay, This might actually be something. And so while maybe right now keeping Pascal isn't top of mind, their number one option, I do think as the month progresses towards February 8th, they could be compelled to, you know, say, hey, this actually kind of works. And the history of the Raptors franchise suggests they're willing to change on the fly if different information presents itself, right? They were about to ship off Kyle Lowry back in 2013-14 after the Rudy Gay trade. And then they started winning a whole bunch of games and they were like, you know what? Maybe we keep this thing together, and that only culminated in a seven-year run that ended up with an NBA championship. I don't think this franchise operates like a lot of others do. I don't think they're compelled by pick packages. And so given all of the options, I I do think if there's not a premium Jalen Johnson, Keegan Murray-level player coming back for Pascal Siakam, they will go the the route they've done before where they re-up their guy, even if the age is not ideal. I'll note, Kyle Lowry was a year older than Pascal Siakam was, is right now when they re-upped him back in 2016-17 after he looked around the league. It seemed like a divorce was imminent, and then there was nothing there. He came back, and all of a sudden, they go and win a championship a couple years later. So I do think, like I said, the Kyle stuff's pretty informative for Pascal, and I think the franchise's track record, you know, there's a lot being mirrored from the past right now that I think we can learn from as far as how they're going to approach this Pascal thing. Today's episode of the Locked On Kings podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. Around New Year's time, we get obsessed with how to change ourselves instead of just expanding on the things that we're doing right and working on some of the things that that we're struggling with. Therapy can be something that can make a New Year's resolution actually achievable or can change your new year's resolution to something that you actually need that you didn't know that you needed therapy is something that i started going uh and and using and and doing and seeing during the pandemic and it truly and i'm not just saying this it truly changed my life changed how i approach certain situations has made me a better person there were so many things that i didn't know that i needed to work on and i didn't know that i needed to unpack that even if I had known, I would have just said, okay, that's that's not a big enough problem for therapy. I'm not dealing with anything serious, but these little things are stuff that we all carry. It's baggage that we all carry that therapy is so helpful to help us tackle and handle and get through. That's why I encourage everybody to give therapy a try. And if you're think, uh, thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be, to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional cost. Celebrate the progress that you've already made this year. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on NBA. I'm aware that I'm probably throwing up a lob lob that you're going to dunk on my head here, which is (laughs) maybe necessary for, for 
kind of Kings fans to hear. Like every every team when they enter a, a trade machine or, or trade deadline, they always look at what riches can I get for my rags type thing. Mm-hmm. And and I don't mean that as a disrespect to to any players, but like that's the reality of the situation. So let's get your honest feedback on sure. the idea of a Barnes Herder. Davion Mitchell package. Those are the three names that the Kings reportedly have made available. Not too hard to figure out why. And in whether it's a Pascal Siakam deal or any deal period involving the Toronto Raptors, why don't or do any of those three intrigue the Raptors or yourself? And if not, why? I think if anyone does, it's probably Herder, Mm -hmm. but... It's not been the same year for him this season. Mm -hmm. And frankly, the Raptors went from, you know, a week and a half ago, having probably the worst guard rotation in basketball to now kind of having like a pretty solid group of Emmanuel Quickly, RJ Barrett, Gary Trent Jr. and Dennis Schroeder, who are all playing awesome right now in their newly defined roles. And so I'm not sure there's like an obvious fit there for Kevin Herter. I I think the Raptors would probably, given their, 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 their druthers, just retain Gary Trent Jr. for something less than what Kevin Herter makes right now and just have that be their sort of bench shooter coming off the bench and sort of working into in between transitional lineups and stuff like that. I don't think Herter would be someone that you project to be a starter for the Raptors if that trade were to go down. As much as I like Herter, I, I just don't know if it fits quite as well now that Quickly and Barrett are on the team. Um, when it comes to Harrison Barnes, like that's very clearly just salary ballast, right? Yes, Harrison Barnes would be like a nice fit just like okay he fills in for pascal he shoots some threes he plays some defense he does all of it at a lesser level than pascal does because that's what happens when you're in your 30s like you know harrison barnes been around a long time he's not the same player he used to be and i I just he's not nearly the dynamic offensive player that pascal is and so i think the raptors would be kind of swimming uphill a little bit with their newly refined really fun working offense to Mm -hmm. throw harrison barnes in there Mm -hmm. as the pascal nominal replacement not to mention Three years of those guys at what a combined uh, two years beyond this one, I suppose, at a combined 33 million bucks. Like, that's not cheap. And I think the Raptors would probably just rather have Pascal Siakam on their team if they, you know, had to go that way. And Davion Mitchell, I'm sorry, I just don't think Davion Mitchell is a very good NBA basketball player. And so mm-hmm. I don't see, and again, he would be like the fifth string guard on the Raptors. I don't mm-hmm. see them being very intrigued there. And again, that's why I keep on coming back to Keegan Murray. That dude fits the bill. That dude fits the quickly Barrett bill of, okay, young player, projectable, does some stuff that would fit on this team right away and can probably grow into something more. And I just don't see the Kings ponying that up. And then, like I said, I don't really think they should. And so barring, like, if I'm looking at the roster and trying to figure out other guys that can kind of be tossed into a deal here to make it more palatable for the Raptors, you know, Malik Monk's a pending UFA. I don't think the Raptors are going to be like eager to go and pay him a ton of money when, they, again, they've just reordered their guard rotation. That feels like a tough one. As much as I love Malik Monk on the Raptors and have wanted him on the Raptors for years, I don't think that makes a ton of sense considering his contractual situation. And so, yeah, barring Keegan Murray being in there, I, I just don't really see it happening mm-hmm. between the Kings and the Raptors. And hey, maybe you maybe you think they're more likely to put Keegan on the table than I am, um, but I, it doesn't seem like they are. And frankly, again, I, for their team and their needs, I'm not sure this is the deal that I would make if I'm Sacramento either. Yeah, Keegan, I, I don't think it's anywhere close to this deal. And I think this is yeah. where negotiations are breaking down, not just with the Raptors, but with almost every team they're trying to negotiate with. Because the Kings He's are... He's really good. You should keep him. He's good. <laughs> right. The Kings are looking to to, to acquire a, a contending piece or a big piece to help them become contenders this year at a concern that teams like Oklahoma City and Minnesota and others are, are starting to pass them up. But uh, they're, I mean, you don't want to give up so early on a, on, a, on a second-year player like Keegan. I know they did it. With Tyrese, and <laughs> it's landed them Demonte Sabonis, so they're a good situation with that. But of course, look what Tyrese is doing over in, in in Indiana. I have this scenario in my head, Sean, because the the Raptors front office was here in Sacramento. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we can imagine there was a meeting between the Raptors front office and the Kings front office to some extent. And I have this idea that they're sitting in this gigantic purple uh, conference room, sitting around a big <laughs> table, and the conversations begin. And Masai says Keegan Murray, and Monty says no. 
And then both sides just sit there at the table and stare at each other for the next hour because that, that's <laughs> where it doesn't just just doesn't go further than that. So both texting Shams while they're at it, like exactly, it's over, like, it's not happening. Yeah, Sorry. they're not. Yeah, yeah they're not, the, the Raptors <laughs> refuse to work with us. They're jerks. Um, I, so I, I mean, I could spew forever, and my listeners have heard me spew forever as to why you just don't trade Keegan Murray at this mm-hmm. point in time. But why do you, from your perspective, the Raptors' perspective, think, man, the Kings like? As good as Pascal is, the Kings should not be including Keegan in a Pascal uh, trade. To me, it just comes down to the fit between Pascal and Demonis Sabonis. I, I don't really think it's there. I think there's too much overlap. I think I they're agree. both guys who like to operate from the post. I think they're both guys who are really nice as like playmaking offensive hubs, but I'm not sure Pascal at this point in his career is like the type of defender who can hold up and sort of make Sabonis even more palatable as like a backline rim protector. I don't think Pascal really has it in him to play small ball five anymore. Um, you know, he he's someone who is like a really nice perimeter defender, can stand in front of dudes and, and stay in front of slippery guards and whatnot. He's really good at, as just like a, a rotational smart team defender, but I don't think he's going to be the sort of helper next to a Sabonis that really mm. makes that defensive front court all that viable. Mm. And I think it's sort of a, you know, you're just kind of getting a little bit too much of the same from them on the offensive end for you to get the full impact of either. And so uh, I think for me, you know, the, the guy who always made sense to me from the Raptors for the Kings was OG like OG on this team would rock like sliding in there next to a uh, shooting heavy backcourt with De'Aaron Fox and, and working off of Demonis Sabonis working from the elbows, finishing off plays as a baseline cutter and lob threat. Like, that's OG's bag. And so I I thought that was the move for them. I I just don't see it with Pascal, especially considering they have to pay him probably a max this summer. And I don't know if you can really go about when you're the Sacramento Kings locking yourself in to a Fox, Sabonis, Siakam, Big 3 with limited means to work around them as the second apron comes in. I just think that's probably a little untenable. And, you know, maybe you could sell yourself on, hey, the Kings are good right now. He's a rental. He helps them win this season. You figure it out. If you have a shot, you have a 2% chance to win the Western Conference. You go all in for it and you try to make it happen and get Pascal Siakam. But I just, I don't see Siakam within this team context really lifting the Kings up to Nuggets level or Wolves level or Thunder level if you're trying to really, you know, punch with the biggest, you know, heaviest hitters in the Western Conference. And I'm saying this as like, one of the most foremost Pascal Siakam aficionados there is. But I also understand, like, Pascal's a difficult guy to work into a team kind of on the fly in the middle of the season in particular, right? Like, he's got a particular set of skills. He's like Liam Neeson and Taken. He's got, like, the the, the sort of, you know, it, it's just you can't just drop him into a team context and hope, okay, this is going to work in half a season and it's going to be fine when you've got something so well established in the form of Fox and Sabonis as a partnership as well. Um, so yeah, you know, a team like Indiana makes sense because they can plop Siakam in and just be like a supercharged version of Obi Toppin and him and Halliburton will make sweet, sweet basketball music and it'll be awesome. I I don't know if the Sabonis Siakam duo works as much as Fox Siakam would be incredible. I would love to watch that. All of Pascal's best times as an NBA player have come playing alongside a dynamic guard, Kyle Lowry, the best of Fred Van Vliet, and hopefully very soon Emmanuel quickly here. Um, but yeah, it, it just, it feels a little bit too tricky of a fit for the Kings to do it in the middle of a season where it might be their one shot to make it work with him before he goes on to somewhere else this summer. And yeah, the, the idea of locking that trio in feels a little rich for me when Keegan Murray could just become like a third guy in that trio. And I think his defense and the leap he's made on that end has been pretty important and pretty telling of what that trio could look like down the line. I think that's probably something the Kings should lean on more than going all in on this season with Siakam and, and tying themselves into a lot of financial and contractual burdens going forward. This episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is also brought to you by FanDuel. Hey, the playoff picture is set in the NFL. So exciting. And now there's plenty of time still to get in on the action at FanDuel for all of the playoffs, the build up to the Super Bowl and everything in between. FanDuel is your place to go for all your NFL betting. Plus, of course, as the Kings season continues and the NBA action rolls on and really heats up as we get closer to the trade deadline, FanDuel is the place for you to go. And right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets. Win 
or lose. The app is so easy to use. There's so many different ways for you to play, like live saving game parlays. You can find bets in their new Explore tab. Uh, you can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, or you can find the best way to, to, to collect and, and see all the popular parlays that are out there. And there's so many more ways for you to play. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make your first bet a layup with FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. There was a report as to one of the reasons why things kind of broke down and ended was because the Kings were unwilling to re-sign Siakam to a max deal, which I'm mm -hmm. I'm aligned in the the line of thinking with the Sacramento Kings there, especially with the idea that that they're going to try and bring back and, and have to pay Malik Monk after this offseason. We see how important Malik is to this Kings team. So I understand Sacramento's, Sacramento's hesitation to sign Pascal to to a max extension. I'll ask you this, regardless of the circumstances, whether it's in Toronto, in Sacramento, Indiana, wherever, do you think Pascal Siakam is a max player? Like a team should comfortably be willing to pay him that kind of money? I think it's got to be the right context. Like I think the Raptors should be comfortable paying him the max. It gets mm. a little tricky down the line, but I don't think having Jakob Pertl's money on the deal on the books for <laughs> two years from now should be what keeps you from signing Pascal Siakam, who I think right now, all things considered, is having like his third best season as an NBA player. This is a guy who's made two All NBA teams. I think he's actually playing better this season than he did. Even in his first All-NBA season back in 2019-20, when Kyle Lowry got robbed, he should have made it. Ben Simmons, what are we doing? But that's for <laughs> another day. That's for my podcast. Uh, but, like, Pascal is just – he's fit so beautifully into the construct of this team and adapted on the fly, right? Like, this is a guy – everything flowed through him over the last couple seasons. He was the be-all, end-all of this team's offense. Scotty Barnes takes a leap. They reorganized reorg things with Darko Ryakovich coming in, running a more sort of boot movement heavy offense. A lot of shooting is like required in this offense, something Pascal has not typically been super great with. You know, he, he's on a really great heater of late, he's shooting like 45% since uh, mid December. But, um, you know, it, it's he struggled to start the season and he's just really kind of assimilated into what the Raptors are doing so beautifully. I think they can justify it. If you're another team, you know, I think the Pacers, totally, 100%. You go and max Pascal Siakam. I think that's like a perfect match made in heaven between him and Tyrese Halliburton. If you're the Sixers, I think if you have the max money to burn and you can make Pascal want to work with Nick Nurse again, by all means, throw the max at him. That could work awesomely as well. But if you're a team that is sort of in the king's spot where you're pretty good, but you need to kind of have that extra final puzzle piece to lock it all in, I just don't know if this version of the Kings is that puzzle piece team for Pascal. Um, you know, he, he's, he's a really, really good basketball player, but he's also a particular basketball player mm -hmm. and you have to have the right context around him to really make it worth your while. And I think the Raptors have gotten closer to having that and making that a worthwhile investment. I don't know if the Kings are in that spot right now. Well, like I said at the beginning, I don't fully believe that the Kings are truly 100% out. I do think we will go back or hear these teams going back to the negotiation table or maybe even a phone call or two happening between these teams again, a little check-in, whether it's the context of the, the Raptors not finding necessarily what they want for Siakam, which you're saying they, they would have no problem in just re-signing him and keeping him around. So maybe that's the bad a bad tactic for the Sacramento Kings to try and wait them out. Or maybe the Kings come back to the table out of a little more desperation, seeing whatever what's happening around them, looking around and going, Siakam is the only star difference making player that we could acquire this year. If we really want to make that swing, that doesn't really seem like Monty McNair style, at least so far, but I mean, who knows if, uh, if, if the heat gets to him a little bit with everything going on at this trade deadline. So either way, I think this will be revisited again, but it might amount to nothing as, as Sean Woodley comes back here on the lockdown Kings podcast, second time in as many years and crushes Kings fans, hopes and dreams of a, uh, <laughs> of a big marquee Kings and Raptors trade. Damn it, Sean. Should I, I start walking around with one of those like Grim Reaper, Grim Reaper scythes in like yeah. a cloak when I come on the podcast, just uh, forget your logic. Day. Take our poor, decent or, slightly below average players and give us your star. <laughs> That's what needs to happen here. That the trade machine says the trade works. So accept it. Damn it. That's that's what you, that's what you need to come here and do is give us what we want. We're in Sacramento and we always get what we want in Sacramento clearly. 
Man, uh, yeah, I, I hope that, uh, you know, cooler heads prevail here. I hope everyone's not too depressed every time I come on the podcast. I hope I'll be <laughs> welcome back to talk about some kind of trade speculation down the line. Uh, but in the meantime, thanks for having me on, man. Big thank you to Sean for joining me here on the Locked on Kings podcast. Hey, maybe if you were hoping for a, a Kings Pascal Siakam trade, maybe that crushed you a little bit. I'm sorry if it did so, but sometimes reality is is hard. But that doesn't mean Sean's 100% right. That doesn't mean that I'm 100% right. Hey, maybe maybe the Raptors are a little more desperate to move Siakam than, than both of us realize. So a trade is still possible. And like I said, I still think negotiations and conversations are going to happen. I don't think anything is going to come of it. I think a, a Siakam to Sacramento deal is it's not dead, but I think it's highly unlikely. But who knows? A lot of things can change. This is a fluid situation. Trade season is crazy as it is. So a, a lot of things could happen that suddenly make this a deal that that either team uh, wants to make or maybe both teams want to make at some point as we get closer and closer to the trade deadline. So we will have to see. Of course, any rumors involving the Kings and Siakam, any actual trades that go down for the Kings and anybody, we'll discuss here at great detail on the Locked On Kings podcast. And the best part about the Locked On Podcast Network is when hosts like uh, like myself and, and Sean and, and, and so many other hosts in our network can get together to discuss uh, topics and, and and things that involve two teams. We can really get down to the weeds of it uh, from from two local experts that you can uh, you uh, re you respect and that you know know what they're talking about. So I appreciate Sean for being willing to to come here on Locked On Kings podcast and and discuss that at great deal. We'll see what happens. Appreciate your support here on the podcast. Can't wait to have you join me on the next episode tomorrow. The Kings start their five game road trip with a game against the Detroit Pistons. So hopefully. I beg after a Kings win, I'll be coming on the uh, uh, with a post game podcast for you. So I hope you will join me for that. Until then, my name is Matt George. You've been listening to the Lockdown Kings podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network.